Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Continue talking about um, alternating current um, and today we will talk about power um, consumed by a circuit through which we have AC, uh, alternating current. Now this lecture is part of the course. The course is called Physics for Teens, presented on unizor.com. Um, so I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website because it has for each lecture, including this one, detailed notes and um, well sometimes I have to do certain calculations and I might bypass these calculations at the board and refer you to the notes for the lecture where they are presented in all details. Now on the same website you have um, a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens uh, math is a mandatory uh, topic to know before you start learning physics in, for any serious kind of a person. Um, and there are many problems and exams and the site is completely free, no financial strings attached, no advertising. So it's all for your consumption. Alright, so power uh, in the uh, alternating current environment. All right. Let me start from certain reminder about what is the power and how it is um, approached in the direct current when you have a constant voltage, constant amperage and certain resistor inside this circuit. Now, remember what actually the voltage is. Voltage was defined as a certain difference in, uh, energ uh, in energetic potential um, between two ends, which we conditionally call plus and minus. And the voltage is constant, it means that the difference in um, potential le level of potential energy is constant. It's like levels of water above certain level and below certain level. So, and it can, it, it, it's constant. And the water goes down, obviously. Same thing with electricity. So, if you have certain constant difference in potentials, let's call it U, then how, it's me how the difference in potential energy actually is me measured. It's, it's measured in the work. So, you have certain amount of electricity which is basically going from this level to this level. And this certain amount of electricity is called, usually measured in coulombs, cool, uh, and the uh, letter is usually uh, Q. And what's important is that the rate of flowing electricity, electric current, uh, uh, electric basically charge, from one level to another, from plus to minus, um, this level is actually defined as basically a, a power. So the power is something like this. And the work performed by flowing uh, charge, flowing electricity from plus to minus is obviously U times Q. That's the work during certain amount of time from zero to t. All right. So this how it is in the direct current. Now the Q divided by t is constant because it's a DC. It's a direct current. It's constant, and it's usually called I. Right. So it's equal to U times I. The difference in electric potential or voltage times. Um, the direct current, electric current, and that's what power actually is. So this is how it is in uh, the uh, direct current. And incidentally, using the Ohm's law, remember Ohm's law? It's equal to U squared divided by R, or I squared times R. So this is something which we know from the direct current. Now, if we are talking about alternating current, 
But I can definitely say that at any moment of time, infinitesimally small, I can actually do exactly the same thing because during this infinitesimal uh, period of time, from t to t plus plus dt, where dt is infinitesimal differential of time. So during this interval of time, I can consider my um, voltage and my amperage, my um, electromotive force, if you wish, and electric current to be constant and equal to E of t, that's voltage, that's electromotive force, and I of t. They are functions of t, functions of time. So, at any given uh, moment of time, the work performed from t to t plus, uh, I'll put it as an index, the work performed from t to t plus dt. It's equal to this times this times time. This is exactly the same thing as for direct current. The voltage time current amperage times the amount of time during which this happens. And correspondingly the power, instantaneous power, at the moment t is equal to just e of t times i of t. So this is basically follows from consideration of a tiny infinitesimal interval of time as the time during which both e and i are well constant and equal to e as a function of time and i as a function of time. And this is basically what power actually is. So, I'm trying to basically approach my power in alternating current from this perspective. However, this is not really very practical. Because whenever you're saying that, okay, the power consumed by an uh, electric bulb is 100 watt. Well, it's, it's a constant number. It's 100. I mean, what does it mean if my power actually consumption is really changing with the time? Because my electromotive force is oscillating, it's sinusoidal, and my current is also oscillating. Now, so I will just put exactly what it is equal to. It's E0 times sine of omega t and i is equal to i0 times sine of omega t plus phi. Now this is something which we have um, discussed in the previous lecture. This is the sinusoidal electromotive force, this is sinusoidal um, current, and we are talking about RLC circuit. which is resistor, inductor, and capacitor in a series. That's the kind of a standard circuit which we are considering. In this, E0 is a peak voltage. I0 is a peak current. Um, omega is um, angular um, uh, speed of oscillations because the uh, alternating current is usually produced by um, rotating uh, rotor inside the electric generator and omega is angular speed of rotation. T is obviously time. Um, now phi is the phase shift introduced by inductor and capacitor. Go to the previous lecture if you don't know what it is. Uh, and I0 is actually related to E0 in a um, pseudo uh, Ohm's law for, um, for AC, for alternating current, where Z square is equal to 
xc minus xl squared plus r, r squared. These are um, reactants, capacitive reactants and inductive reactants, and this is resistor. All this was in the previous couple of lectures. So z is actually the square root of this. So what I meant is that this is an exact power consumption at moment t, well actually from t to dt, and we have to multiply by dt, by differential of time. But during the time t as a function of t, this is the power consumption. It's a rate of the work which um, electricity is making inside the circuit. Okay, so as I was saying, it's a variable and it's not very convenient to talk about. Now, let, let's recall, we were introducing things called E effective and I effective. Effective voltage and effective amperage. Incidentally, each one of them are equal to peak divided by square root of 2. Peak divided by square root of 2. And again, we have derived y. It's all kind of an averaging um, of the uh, uh, current and, uh, and, and voltage uh, during, uh, let's say, one period of oscillation. Um, now, here we also can do very, very similar thing. Because we can always find work which is basically performed by the electricity during one period of oscillation and then divide by the length of this period and that would be average work within one particular period of oscillation which is exactly the same as average on any number of periods because the period because the functions are periodic as you see in the same period by the way here and here the period is t is equal to 2 pi divided by omega. Omega is a speed, angular speed, so one oscillation which is 2 pi, 360 degree, if we divide by speed we will get the time. So we will find out how much work is done during this period t, one period of oscillation. Now as soon as we will find out what's amount of work, if we will divide it by t, we will have an average power per unit of time, if you wish. Which is basically not exactly right. The correct terminology is basically we have to uh, have the first derivative of it. But it doesn't really matter because we were talking about one period, we divide by the period, so that's the average per period. And that's what conveniently called P effective. Effective power. And that's where and this is the constant, because it's the same for each period. Um, and that's what actually is meant when people are saying that, okay, this electric bulb is uh, consuming 100 watt. That means that during one particular uh, period of oscillation, the average power consumption is 1 watt. And one period of oscillation is a very small amount of time. Uh, it's one fiftieth or one sixtieth of a second, because that's what usually commercial um, AC uh, oscillations are. So for any reasonable amount of time, practical amount of time, like a minute or an hour or something like this, we can very safely use this particular power consumption. So our purpose right now is to find the work performed by electricity during one period of time and then we will divide it by uh, time. All right, so let's do that. So what is amount of work which is performed by electricity during the time from 0 to 
certain t, any t actually, but we will use t as a period, obviously. Well, it's integral p of t dt, right? This is power consumed at the moment t. We are assuming that during the infinitesimal period of time dt from lowercase t to lowercase t plus dt, this power remains constant. So we will multiply power by time, get the work performed from t to dt, to t plus dt. And then we integrate from 0 to capital T, and that's how we get the whole work. Well, let's just calculate this integral, no big deal, right? What's equal to? We know what pt is. So we will take e0 and i0 outside, and we will have integral from 0 to t of multiplication of 2 sine. Now, from uh, this is a very easy integral, by the way. From trigonometry, we should convert a product of signs into sum or difference. Actually, here it is cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to what? Cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. And cosine of alpha minus beta is equal to plus alpha beta plus sine alpha sine beta. So what do we do? From this, from the second, we will subtract the first we will have cosine cancelled, we will have 2 sine by sine. So basically, sine alpha times sine beta is equal to the second one, cosine alpha minus beta minus the first one, alpha plus beta, divided by 2, right? Subtract from this this, we will have double multiplication of sines, so that's why we divided by 2. And this is the difference between two cosines. Now, in this case, we will do exactly the same. So we will have E0, I0, integral from 0 to t. So sine times sine is cosine of minus. So if we will take minus, it will be phi. Minus phi, actually, but it doesn't really matter because the cosine is um, even function. So cosine of minus phi is equal to cosine of phi. So we will have here cosine of phi minus cosine of the sum, which is 2 omega t plus phi. And we have to divide everything by 2, so we will put 1 second 2, and dt. So that's our integral. Now, obviously, we will uh, uh, make it as two integrals because integral is additive function so it will be integral of cosine and cosine is a constant right phi is an angle which is measured uh, based on um, difference between xc xl remember tangent phi is equal to xc minus xl divided by r but this is reactance of capacity capacitor this is the reactance of inductor so it's a constant. It's basically determined by the characteristics of the uh, circuit, right? Just in case you forgot about what is reactance, Xc is equal to 1 over omega C, and Xl is equal to omega L, where C is a capacitance and L is inductance of the inductor. Okay, so this is all from the previous couple of lectures. So I'm just using now, the cosine is a constant, so it goes out from the integral, and all we have is integral of dt, which is actually, from 0 to t, which is actually t. So we have equal to 1 over 2 e0 i0 cosine phi times t. That's my first part. Now, minus. Now, what is the minus? Now, let's think about integral of um, of cosine. 
well, even if you don't think about anything, if T is a period and the periodicity, the periodicity of this function is what? It's T divided by 2 omega, right? Which is, you know, uh, which is multiple of, 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 of periods. So we should expect actually this to be equal to zero, right? Because if you take a plane function, let's say cosine, now this is a period. Obviously, if you integrate it, it's sum of this plus sum of this. It's supposed to be equal to zero. And it is equal to zero. Now, if you want, we can prove it analytically. So our intuition is right. So we have integral from zero to t. We have minus cosine of 2 omega t plus phi dt, right? That's what we have. Now, cosine is um, a derivative of the sine, right? So we can have the um, indefinite integral should be uh, minus sine 2 omega t plus phi with some kind of a multiplier. So the derivative of this is cosine um, times 2 um, omega. So I have to divide it by 2 omega. And I have to do it from 0 to t. <coughs> right? Now, t is one period, right? One period is 2 omega divided by uh, 2 pi divided by omega. So if I will substitute this t for this, uh, what I will have? I will have sine of um, t is equal, lowercase t is equal to capital T. So what will be? It will be 4 pi, right? Omega will cancel out. 4 pi plus pi divided by 2 omega. That would be for t. And for 0 it would be sine of phi. But again, sine is a periodic function, so this value and this value give the same value of sine. That's why this will be 0. So we will have 0. So this part disappears. That's the answer, basically. This is an answer of, this is my work performed during this time, where T is a period of uh, oscillation. Now, from this, we can obviously say that the power, the average power, or we can call it effective power, is equal to work during this period of time divided by time. So it's equal to one half E zero I zero cosine phi. Let me make it a little more practical again. I zero and and E zero are peak voltage and voltage and amperage. And again we are not really used to these peak kind of characteristics in practice. When we're talking about voltage in the AC outlet to be like 220 or 120 or 100, whatever, uh, volts, it means effective voltage. And again, if you forgot about what effective is, go to one of the previous lectures. It's all explained there. So effective voltage is by square root of 2 smaller than the peak. And it's defined basically through the work. I mean, what is my effective voltage and effective um, amperage, which if it was a direct current, it performed exactly the same work. So that's what effective is. So in this particular case, we know that effective voltage is smaller by square root of 2 
of effective of peak voltage and effective current is also by square root of 2 smaller than peak so the effective ones are constant which give exactly the same work if we have a direct so direct current with this voltage and this amperage give exactly the same work as alternating current with uh, sinusoidal uh, voltage and sinusoidal um, amperage so if this is true you see this 2 this 2 is 1 square root of 2 times another square root of 2 so I can actually use them and I will put that P effective is equal to E effective times I effective times cosine phi. So E0 divided by square root of 2 is E effective, I0 divided by square root of root is I effective, and that's why we have this formula, which is very simple, and what's very important is this cosine. Okay, now let's talk about this cosine. Okay. If we are talking about RLC circuit, it contains resistor capacitor and inductor. So let's consider different cases. What if I have only R circuit? If I have R circuit, it means that capacitive reactants and inductive reactants are absent, they are zero. No capacitor, no inductor, just a resistor. <coughs> Tangent phi is equal to xc minus xl divided by r, which in this particular case, phi is equal to what? If tangent is equal to zero, my angle is equal to zero. So the cosine is equal to one, and I have this formula. P effective is equal to E effective times I effective because the cosine of zero is one. This is exactly the same as if it's a direct current. You see, that's a very important demonstration of why effective voltage and defective current are very important because the law which basically expresses the power consumption is exactly but uh, not exactly. It looks exactly the same as the corresponding law for direct current, where the p is g just equal to e times i, where all of them are constant. Okay, so that's very important. So there is no uh, capacitor and no inductor. Similarly, if there is a capacitor and there is an inductor, but they are equal to each other, and we call this a resonance, then we will have exactly the same. Uh, we will have the same formula because then my tangent is equal to zero, my angle is equal to zero, my cosine is equal to one. So if I don't have capacitor and inductor or I have both of them and they have the same reactances, capacitive reactants is equal to inductive reactants, which means that one over omega C is equal to omega L or omega qu square is equal to 1 over L times C. If this is given, so my inductance times capacitance give me the uh, inverse, give me a square of angular velocity. Or if you wish, L times C is equal to 1 over omega square, same thing. So if this condition is satisfied, then we still have exactly the same formula because the cosine will be equal to 1. 
If, however, I have something like RC, which means reactant, uh, resistor and uh, capacitor with certain reactants, so XL is equal to zero. What do I have in this case? Well, I have certain tangent, positive, by the way. Um, so in my formula, the, if phi will be with a plus sign, actually. Um, and I will have, you know, certain correction to the product of uh, effective um, voltage times effective uh, amperage. And the correction factor will be the cosine of x uh, of, of, the f of the angle tan tangent of which it would be equal to xc divided by, uh, by rr. Same thing with rl. In this case, the tangent would be negative, right? X, xc would be 0, and this would be minus something. So we will have a negative angle, and we will have correspondingly the, um, the negative, uh, negative angle. But the cosine of negative angle is, is the same as cosine of the positive angle. So that doesn't really affect the power. So basically, that's the final formula I wanted to basically convey to you. And certain cases when, um, uh, when we can apply this formula. And um, OK, basically, that's it. Um, read the notes for this lecture. Um, they contain maybe some other considerations. Like one of the considerations, what if we don't have R? I mean, it's not practical. We don't have any circuit without any kind of resistance, right? Without any kind of resistors. Everything, even just plain wire, consumes certain, it, it has certain resi resistance and it consumes energy. But it's interesting that L by itself, or C by itself, inductor or conductor or combination, if there is no resistance, my denominator is zero, which means my tangent is equal to 90 degree, the cosine would be equal to zero, and the power consumption is zero. So if there is no resistor, there is no power consumption. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.